This is Bible Academy. We are in Psalm 18, the second part. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and everything you've provided so that we can study your word this day. We ask now that our hearts and minds will be open to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> By way of review, Psalm 18, back in verse 19, David speaks of his deliverance, having been brought to an open place. And then he begins from the second half of verse 19 to provide for us a category of blessing. That is, being blessed based upon one's conduct. This is in keeping with the overall principle of the Mosaic Law, that when obeyed, there was blessing, and when there was disobedience, There was a cursing. Well, this is true on the individual level also. David shows us in this psalm that when he lived the righteous life, God blessed him. This is true of the nation also, as we see in the stages of discipline in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So this is a level of blessing we want to understand and also, we can apply that today. God blesses those who live obedient lives. This doesn't take away from his mercy or his grace where it's undeserved. But let's understand, God wants us as his own to live obedient lives. Scripture is clear that God wants to bless us. But we should also keep in mind that the ultimate goal of this blessing whether it be overt prosperity or divine discipline, the ultimate goal is our spiritual advancement. Again, verse 19 shows us that God may bless because of what we do. Let's look at our translation going back to verse 19. He brought me to an open place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and I have not acted wicked from the Lord, departing from the Lord. For all his laws were before me, and I did not turn away from his decrees. I was also blameless with him, and I kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyes. Well, we come to verse 25 where we see a continuation of the same type of blessing. With the faithful, you prove yourself faithful. With the blameless man, you show yourself faithful blameless. Let's talk about a couple of these words here. The word faithful, first of all, uh, a word we should be familiar with, kasid. It means faithful, godly, loyal. The other word we want to look at is blameless. And we have two aspects of this in this passage. The word is tamim. For man, it means honest and devout. Uh, he's doing the right thing before God. When it's used of God, it has to do with his perfections, his impeccability. So when we look at this verse again, we understand it a little deeper. With the faithful, you prove yourself faithful, loyal. With a blameless man, one who's honest and devout before God, keeping the law, you show yourself Perfect. God responds perfectly to the blameless man. Not that he ever responds imperfectly, but to keep the parallel, we use the word blameless for God also. 
listen to this. When the believer is faithful to God in David's day, it would be keeping within the Mosaic law. God in turn responds. He causes himself, that's the uh, causative stem, hill, uh, stem here, uh, what show, says you show yourself. God causes himself, shows himself to be loyal to that believer. So in a similar way, when the believer lives a blameless life, he keeps his sins to a minimum, confesses when he does sin, and the Lord shows himself to be impeccable towards him. <clears throat> the Lord will act towards that believer perfectly, whatever is called for, whatever fits the believer's situation, the Lord will act perfectly towards him. Now these two terms, faithfulness and blamelessness, are particularly meaningful when it comes to covenant loyalty. Uh, something we don't think about too much today because we live under the new covenant, but under the old covenant or what we call the Mosaic covenant. <clears throat> covenant loyalty was imperative. Loyalty to the covenant in the sense of obeying it and staying within the bounds of those rules and regulations that's taught from uh, Exodus 20 through Deuteronomy. Living blameless under the covenant. And if you did that, you were considered loyal. Let's use the word kessed. All right, sometimes you'll see it with an I. Kessed. It means loyal love. You want us to show love towards God? Live within the covenant. Whatever you did in life, <clears throat> stay within the bounds of the Mosaic law. And within then, Within that law, you have the freedom to do whatever you want. Make whatever choices you want. All right? Go outside the law. You're going to end up getting disciplined as a nation. You got cursed. In verse 26, David gives us another parallel in the verse itself. But this one is not like parallel we saw, but we see the opposite. One line's opposite from the other. With the pure, you show yourself pure. With the crooked, you show yourself astute. Let's talk about some of these words again. With the pure, you show yourself pure. The word is barar, means pure, cleansed, to be purified. With the pure, you show yourself pure. Now the next two words are interesting. And with the crooked, a kish, this is one who's twisted, perverted, he goes the wrong way. The application towards the Lord, the word is not crooked exactly, it's pathel, translated astute. It basically means twisted. But in a good sense, it means shrewd or astute. So let's look at it this way. Regarding the word pathel. The good side is that of being pure. Towards the believer. The Lord acts pure we can expect the right and good thing. Now that's with the word barar for pure, the top half of the verse. The bad side of that, the opposite, the crooked, is the one who does not obey the law. That means he goes outside the boundaries on a regular basis, or perhaps he lives outside the boundaries. Out here, it's crooked. He's trying to twist the law, pervert the law, make the law fit his lifestyle. He's constantly going the wrong way. That's the idea. Now, with this person, let's go to the next page. <clears throat> next two. With this person, with the crooked person, the one who is acting in a perverse style, the Lord is said to be astute. Now, exactly what does that mean? 
Now, the word means that the Lord not only knows about all the tricks of the trade, the twisted ways of the crooked, but in an astute manner, the Lord knows how to deal with them. So if this guy's going path one, the Lord knows how to deal with it. He meets it. He goes another path. The Lord knows how to meet it. Meets it. <laughs> meet it. Excuse me. It's early. If he decides to be really sneaky and devious, all right, he's going to go this way. The Lord knows again how to meet and deal with that type of person. That's the idea. He knows how to deal with those who act outside the law and go every which way. No one <clears throat> ever gets one up on the Lord. The perverted person who thinks he can sneak one past God will find himself easily outwitted by the Lord. <clears throat> no one can outthink, outguess, or pull one over on the Lord. If one thinks he can, he may find himself in the very hole he thought he dug for someone else or the very trap he set for another. While the perverse plan to deceive and hurt the believer, while the perverse plans to deceive and hurt the believer, God in turn may bring on him the most torturous results. And note again how through these verses we see how the psalmist tells us how the Lord mirrors the behavior of those he's dealing with. This is a way in this poetic psalm to teach us that God responds to the way we act. Now that's not always the case, but that's what David is saying here. And we'll see this as we continue through the psalm. Verse 27 gives us another contrasting parallel. For you deliver those with humility, but those with proud eyes you bring low. Let's look at some of the words, the word for deliver. Yasha, it means save or deliver. The word for humble, for you deliver those with humility, the word is ani. It means humble, afflicted, or the needy. And with the proud, he brings them low. The word is shafel, to bring down, to bring low. So the idea is that those who are humble, who are submissive to the Lord, or those who are in dire need, the Lord delivers. However, with the arrogant, the Lord brings them down or makes them low, or we could say humbles them. In verse 28, David continues to praise the Lord for how he brings light into the life of the faithful. For you light up my lamp, the Lord my God illumines my darkness. If you've been studying John with me as I am doing this concurrently with the Psalms, you know that light is a major theme in John representing the Lord Jesus. Light represents life. For the light to go out for the wicked means death. Here it refers to the Lord bringing a good life to the faithful believer. For your light, my lamp, the Lord, my God, illumines my darkness. Now this last line, regarding the Lord illumining the believer's darkness, the Lord can take a dark situation for us and turn it into day. Overcoming hardship with joy, Persecution with blessing, replacing sadness with happiness. When we are trapped and in trouble, the Lord can turn the situation completely around. He can put the proud down, 
putting the perverse in his place, easily outmaneuvering the wicked and bringing light into the life of the believer. The Lord can bring us out of any dark situation into the light. He can deliver us and bring us to the point of safety. Beginning in verse 29, we get back into a military situation and we will see some of those terms. Earlier we saw the psalmist trapped, snared, surrounded, confronted, and near death from the enemy. He was in a serious, dark situation. Now we will see how the Lord delivers him from that darkness. Verse 29. For by you I can run advance quickly against a troop of soldiers, and by my God I can jump over a wall. Very interesting uh, uh, verse and showing the agility and strength he gets when he advances against the enemy. He can even leap over a wall, which is what he needs to do sometimes in battle. So the Lord gives him the ability, the strength, the agility, the quickness, whatever is needed to do battle. Verse 30. He returns to the Lord. As for God, his way is perfect, meaning blameless. The word of the Lord is tested as pure or reliable. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. The word perfect is tamim again. We saw that verse 23 and 25. It means blameless. For here, uh, for God, here we translate it perfect rather than blameless. The word of the Lord is tested, and I put in brackets, as pure and reliable. There were times when, before David did something like going to battle, that he would inquire of the Lord as to what his will was, whether going to battle, was it going to be victory, and so on. There are four examples of these inquiries in 1 Samuel 23, 2-12. Let's look at two of them. Now, here's what we're looking at. The second line, let me underline it, <clears throat> in verse 30, the word of the Lord is tested as pure and reliable. We're going to see that happening in 1 Samuel 23, verse 2. We'll look at two examples. Speaking of David, 1 Samuel 23, 2. He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, Go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Here in Judah we are afraid. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the Philistine forces? Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, Go down to Keilah, for I am going to give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went down to Keilah, fought the Philistines, and carried off their livestock, and indicated that there was complete victory. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Keilah. So here we have an example of him inquiring of the Lord and testing his word whether it was true. And it certainly was. We see the word of the Lord being tested out as perfectly true and reliable. Now let's look at the last line. Verse 30. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Now we've seen these words already. Shield, uh, metaphorical for protection, refuge, the place you want to be in time of danger and the Lord's care completely. Here the Lord protects and gives refuge to those who seek to take refuge in Him. Now folks, don't miss that last point. You have to want to seek refuge in Him. That's the idea. He will take care of you, but you have to make the decision to put yourself in His care. Now, he may do it anyway. That would be out of his mercy, out of his grace. And he often does that. But when we get in a tight jam, like David explaining right here, seek refuge in him. 
That is where he'll protect you. Verse 31. Builds upon that principle. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a cliff rock except our God? We haven't seen this kind of expression before. But basically, well, let's look at a couple of the words. Here we see the covenant name, Lord. Point that out to you. Also, we see the word God. Now, this is an unusual form translated God. Usually it's Elohim. This one is Eloah. Eloha. Actually, Eloha. It's a singular form. Usually we see Elohim. That's the plural. This is a singular. So basically what he's saying, who is God besides the Lord? This is a way of saying, uh, or way of raising the question. Let me say it one more time. For who is God besides the Lord? Answer, no one is. Who is a cliff rock except our God? Remember the cliff rock was the special place of refuge? No one is. You see? This is a way of declaring, it's a Hebrew idiom, there's no other God besides the Lord. There's no other cliff rock or refuge except only our God. So, after all these uh, rescues, experiencing the refuge and the deliverance, the victories, David declares, Who is God besides the Lord? Now, in verses 32 through 34, we're moving rather rapidly here. Verse 32, we see more of God equipping the warrior David. Verse 32, the God who equips me with strength and makes my path smooth. That's another question form. Here we see another uh, application for David here. This time, both personally and as king. So there's a twofold application. The God here is just. It's a combination of two words, another form of God, El, with the article, Ha'el. That's saying, the God. It puts a distinctiveness in it. The God who equips me with strength and makes my path smooth. Now, as I said, there's a two-fold application here. I want us to see it in a couple of ways here. Let me put the verse back up as personal or as king. Now, as personal, David could see the Lord equipping him with the strength he needed to be a warrior. As king, God would give him the strength for his army. Uh, same way in making his path smooth as an individual. Uh, we've seen the path smooth regarding one's walk with God. God makes the path smooth. He, clear out, he clears out the obstacles as one walks in the and loyalty to the covenant, the Lord removes the obstacles. Not that there's not test in life, but the obstacles that would lead him into sin. Uh, he's able to avoid those. He has the strength and power to do it. Also, regarding his army as a king, his army would have the uh, path they would need to make uh, maneuvering easy uh, or possible. In other words, he moves the obstacles for his army. So we see a twofold application, both as an individual and for the king, for his army. We get back to the individual in verse 33 when he says, He makes my feet like the feet of deer, and he enables me to stand on high places. The feet of deer means he can run fast and with agility. To be able to stand on high places can mean a couple of things, like a sure-footed mountain goat. He could climb the hills, stand in high places. Uh, he could move along the ridges, along the cliffs, along the rocky uh, side faces of a mountain because he has the ability to negotiate uh, that rough terrain. As a leader, as a king, David's able to lead and set the example for his men. 
can set the pace being able to climb over these hills and over the rocks and able to maneuver uh, leading his army over this rugged terrain and then take the high ground. Verse 34, one of the more famous verses. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. Now listen, David actually attributes his ability to train for battle to the Lord. The bow of bronze, the bow wouldn't actually be made out of bronze. Uh, it'd be made out of wood so you can bend it. But the idea is that his arms are strong so he can bend a powerful bow and shoot the arrows. That was one of the major weapons uh, by this time for Israel. Now let's make some application. Now this is going to be one you probably haven't heard before, at least not recently. This is a unique application. Let me start by asking you a question. What is it that you believe God wants you to do? Think about this. After you learn the principle, you might want to pause or later think of your own application. We'll take David. David was a military commander. He led soldiers in battle. He himself personally fought and killed the enemy. God trained him to do that. Yes, David had to choose to be obedient to God. But God led him and showed him how to fight in battle. How to kill the enemy how to outmaneuver the enemy. The application is, what is it that God wants you to do? Only you know, uh, besides God, of course, until you share it with others, but whatever God wants you to do, He will give you the ability to do it. Now, don't cut God short on this. If you think you're to be a doctor, and it requires high grades and hard study, you ask God to give you the ability to study hard and learn those things. Uh, let's go back to uh, military training. If you're in the military and you're going to be a good warrior, a good soldier, or maybe you're a mechanic on an airplane, uh, however you serve, I say good for you. You pray that God will make you the best. That you'll learn your trade or your skill, whether it be fighting the enemy or working on a helicopter or taking care of the air conditioners in the barracks. If that's how you serve the Lord, you ask the Lord to give you what you need to do it. Some of you mothers trying to take care of children, maybe many children, I know how it can get to you. Just watching my, old, my own wife over the years and having to deal with all the kids myself, it can be a real challenge. But God can give you the strength to do that. Uh, we homeschool our children. We're uh, homeschooling. We're down to three now. We've got three in college. But we homeschool them. They did Some did better than others, but they got to college, and they were pretty much... Um, doing uh, much better than most everybody else. They had the discipline, they had the training, they had the motivation. Uh, though they may come into their own later, we pray that God will give them the ability to do what they need to do, and God will give you that. Because why? Because He wants you to accomplish what He has for you. So He's going to give you what you need. If He wants you to be a doctor, He wants you to be a lawyer, He wants you to be Someone just who works in a in a 7-Eleven store, a quick store, or a quick shop store, he will give you what you need. It may be protection if it's a tough neighborhood. I've had to deal with that recently. But God will give you, he will enable you, just as he enabled David to train his hands for war. He'll give you what you need to do what he wants you to do. And there's a great variation here 
in personal application, whether it be studying in school or a job or getting yourself in shape, uh, physically or mentally. God enables, God heals, God strengthens. He gives clarity of thought to deepen your thinking, develop your skills. I know that as people get older, and I include myself there, uh, it, it, it becomes more difficult to read for long hours because of the eyes. Or uh, medication can get you sleepy. You pray that God will give you the strength to learn the word and grow spiritually. Give yourself over to him. Think about the Lord, what he did with Moses at 80. Uh, Stephen, under the pressure of martyrdom. Peter and Paul, what the Lord did with these men. And not to mention the many women, uh, the Marys, the Marthas. Verse 35 we continue to see the Lord's provision. David's talking personally now, talking to the Lord, and you give me the shield of salvation. That means also deliverance. I have a tendency to translate this word deliverance because salvation is, of course, associated with our, uh, uh, our eternal life, salvation from sin, but we're talking about physical deliverance here. And your right hand sustains me. And your humility, now this is an interesting word for the Lord, I put in the explanation, willingness to condescend enabled me to be great or prevail. The shield of salvation. Let's talk about that. That's the shield of protection, of deliverance. Protection while you're being delivered. The idea that your right hand sustains me, that's God's power providing what you need to get through it. And this last line, one that requires a little discussion, the word is humility, that's used for the Lord. In what way is the Lord humble towards us? Well, let me just say, say this last phrase again. And your humility, that is willingness to condescend, enabled me to be great or prevail. The idea here is that the Lord is willing to come down to man to provide what he needs. This willingness of God to bring himself down to the level of man to answer his cry and provide the answer is sometimes called condescension. That is, the Lord getting involved in our lives. The NIV, the 84 version, uses the phrase, you stoop down. It gives another angle to it. But that's the idea. The Lord lowers himself, in a sense, to come down to our level and help us out. Condescends. And verse 36 gives us more on the God-given agility he gave to the psalmist David. Listen to this. You widen my stride beneath me, and my ankles do not slip. Now this, again, is physical. It's personal. Uh, I don't want to say this is metaphorical for you know, walking with the Lord, though some might want to say that, but I think we're still in the military terms here in that part of this psalm. My stride beneath me. You widen my stride beneath me. Well, that's the idea of uh, I can run. I can do what I need to to move. My ankles do not slip. A good, steady running pace. So here we see the Lord provide both the ability to, uh, well, in the service we called it force march. You're talking long strides and moving fast, maybe with a heavy load for long distances to cover as much ground as you can. Uh, you can't really jog with heavy packs, but if you force march, which is very fast walking, you can cover a lot of ground. But this would include also running, uh, having steady and sturdy footwork while moving across various types of terrain. 
again, these are phrases and descriptions of words for those uh, going into to battle or preparing for battle. Verse 37, I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and I did not turn back until they were finished. Here we see the stamina, the endurance David had in pushing his enemies and then overtaking them. He did not turn back or give up. He stayed with it until the mission was accomplished. Again, the verse, I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and I did not turn back until they were finished. To put that in an uh, application for you, you didn't turn back, you didn't stop studying until you finished the course. You didn't quit or give up on the job until it was completed, you see. You worked your way through homeschooling your children all the way to high school whenever they were done. You stuck with it, even though sometimes it seemed impossible. The Lord gave you the strength. The military terms continue in verse 38, describing victory over the enemy. I shattered them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. Now this is very descriptive. We do not think of people being shattered. But the word means shattered or smashed to pieces. Uh, you would, uh, with swords, uh, you can just imagine. The idea is they are utterly beaten to the ground. They fell under my feet. They can't get up. Completely defeated. Victory over the enemy. Verse 39 continues the military terms. You armed me with strength for battle. You have made those who rise up to bow down beneath me. Talk about the word armed. That's the word I translated equipped earlier. This context seems a little better for the word armed. You armed me, or you could use equipped me with strength for battle. Now, let me just reiterate. God will give you the strength to do what you need to do to get through the day, to get through the night, to get through whatever challenge you have that day, driving in traffic, having to sit on an airplane for, for eight hours. Those can be challenges. But you've got to go to the Lord about it. Ask Him. Put it in His hands. And watch Him work on your behalf. The second line says, you have made those who rise up, that would be like the enemy rising up against you, the adversary, to bow down. That could mean surrender or submission. Beneath me, they submit, you see. Verse 40. You have put the backs of my enemy to me in flight, and I destroy those who who hate me. The Hebrew puts it this way, basically um, telling the Lord, you have put the backs of my enemy to me. Of course, we wouldn't put it that way, but that's the idea. You've made him turn and run. I put in flight there to help interpret this, but that's the idea. The enemy are running, retreating, um, in flight. doesn't sound like it's an organized manner, but they are getting out of there because you're on your way. That's the idea. The second line, and I destroy those who hate me. Keep in mind, this is a war setting. Uh, the enemies of Israel, the enemies of David. Uh, David had enemies both within Israel and outside of Israel, depending on the time we're talking about. But at any rate, whichever it is, they want to see David dead. They hate him that David destroyed them. You remember that too on a practical basis. Those who go after you personally, who hate you for whatever reason, by that I mean uh, just as long as you haven't sinned towards people 
and people can hate you because of you're better than you're better uh, an operator than them. You're doing uh, more, uh, making better grades, whatever it may be. You don't live the way they live, and they resent it. Uh, people can hate you for many reasons. Just remember, you do what you need to do to get your job done. The Lord will take care of those people. In war, it may mean to destroy them. Verse 41. Listen to what they do. They cry for help, but there is no deliverer. Even to the Lord, but he does not answer them. Here we have the uselessness of the cry of those who do not know God and who hate his people, that is, believers. Now, of course, the Lord hears everything just as he sees and knows everything, but he does not respond to that cry of the unfaithful, the unbeliever who hates and who is out to, in this case, kill believers. Since it says they cry to the Lord, Yahweh, that could mean one or two things. Maybe both here to spread the application. The Lord would be Yahweh, that's the word. Then they would normally, that would normally place them within Israel, like the armies of Saul, when they pursued David, or those in rebellion against David, and they saw themselves suddenly getting slaughtered, and they cried to the Lord. But we could also assume that that would be those who randomly call out to Yahweh outside of Israel. Uh, it was common that uh, those in the pagan world outside of Israel would not only call upon their own gods, but call on any god that could win them, uh, help them win the battle. And that would include Yahweh. They knew of uh, the God of Israel, and they would just throw his name up there too, you see, hoping that all these gods could help them get out of their jam, help them win a battle, help them survive. So either one of those ideas could be here, uh, or both. Any god that would help is the idea in the ancient world. So they cry for help, but there is no deliverer, even to the Lord. But he does not answer them, both within Israel and outside of Israel. Verse 42. By the way, you never want to be on the downside. You don't want to be on the wrong side of a battle when God's people are involved. And by that I mean those who are following. Well, today we'd say following Christ. Verse 42. David speaks personally here in first person. I beat them as dust upon the face. That means before the face of the wind. I poured them out like mud on the streets. Now, let me just say this regarding our, our uh, poem as we continue here. Uh, we've seen some repetition. We're going to see more repetition, uh, repetition, more of the same terms, same phrases, same ideas. Keep in mind that this is poetry. This is a praise song. And David is coming back to reason he's, reasons he's praising the Lord. Uh, you might think of it as a uh, chorus in a song. He repeats lines, he repeats words. Just keep in mind it's because it's poetic and it's to be sung as praise. We, we go through this uh, almost like a narrative. This is the way it's somewhat presented. But then we see these repetitions again and say, here we go again. The same words, the same phrases. But again, remember, this is poetry. This is a, a psalm. And it's a praise psalm at that. So we see uh, a lot of repetition. Now let's look at this verse. I beat them as dust upon the face. That means before the face of the wind. So uh, this figure basically says I'm beating the, well, uh, I'm beating them to death, you might say. To the point of they're just crumbles, they're dust. So they blow away in the wind. I poured them out like mud on the streets. Uh, that's the idea. They, they're 
beat down to the nothing and then pour down on the streets where people walk on them. Getting pretty descriptive there. Verse 43. You have delivered me from the military conflicts of the people. You establish me as the leader of nations, a people whom I do not know serve me. Now we see David speaking as king. As a leader of nations, David conquers other nations and people and brings them under Israel's control, both within their borders and without, outside their borders. Some were brought into the uh, empire of Israel. Uh, there are many nations, Philistines, Moabites, Zobah, Hamoth, and others. There's a list in 2 Samuel 8. So that's the idea. David conquered nations on his borders and beyond. Uh, those on his borders would become buffer states. That is, they would be a a place where the enemy would come into first before they entered his nation, he, he could go fight him there. Or that nation would have a, a treaty with Israel, and they would have to begin to fight him as Israel might come to the rescue, you see. And he also had uh, peoples that, were, that came within the empire, who he also ruled. A people whom I do not know serve me. These weren't Israelites, you see. But they were blessed being under David's rule. Remember, he was God's representative king for his kingdom on earth as presented by Israel. Verse 44. At the hearing of the ear, that's the idea, as soon as they heard, or as soon as they hear, they obey me. Sons of foreigners cringe in obedience before me. The idea of cringe in obedience... Let's look at that word. Kakish, it means to feign in obedience. They're powerless to do anything, so they cringe. When they hear David coming, when they see his armies coming, uh, his reputation precedes him. And they fear. And immediately, if they were smart, they knew the reputation of David's army, they were constantly victorious. They would surrender or make peace. The idea, let me put the verse back up. Da King David's reputation and that of his armies became well known in the Middle East. Nations feared him. Some peoples would willingly submit because they did not want to go to war with him. Uh, have you ever heard of King Toy? T-O-I, of Hamath. He did that, 2 Samuel 8, 9, and 10. So the idea is that nations hear David's army coming and they in fear surrender, make peace, try to get a good treaty with them. Verse 45 describes this further. Sons of foreigners lose heart and come trembling out of their fortresses. Here we see them willing to make peace again instead of war. Uh, they don't want to be defeated. They don't want to be slaughtered. 2 Samuel 10, 19. So they would come out and surrender out of their fortresses. Uh, their so-called secure places, you see. Well, we've got verses 46 through 50 yet. And as we wind this up, David repeats... Some of the main themes of the psalm, praise, refuge, and deliverance. The Lord lives. That means he's active. Blessed be my cliff rock. Exalted be the God of deliverance. The Lord is active and alive and acting on David's behalf. That's the idea. The Lord lives. David sees the Lord living in his life every day. He sees the Lord acting on his behalf. 
Do you do that? If you are constantly depending on Him to give you the strength, the protection, your needs to grow you spiritually, to get you through the test of every day, to watch over your family, your children, yourself, you see the Lord active in your life. And when you come home at night, you're thankful uh, that you're safe, that your family's safe, that you've gotten through the day. And now, you want him to get you through the night. David says, blessed be my cliff rock. That's the word we saw earlier for uh, uh, the cliff that was the secure place. The word sewer. Verse 47. The God who executes vengeance for me and makes peoples, that means nations also, submit under me. David winds this up. It's the God who executes vengeance for me. You know, the Lord will deal with people. Uh, unless you are assigned that position some way um, to discipline people or deal with people uh, in a disciplinary manner, put those people in the Lord's hands. Uh, let him do the vengeance. The Lord knows much better than us how to deal with people. He knows how to shut them down, how to disqualify them, how to neutralize them, and how to take them out of the way. That includes peoples. David is king. That include, included nations. There were some nations he didn't have to fight. They were afraid to fight him. And they submit to him under King David's governance. Verse 47 again, the God who executes vengeance for me and makes peoples or nations submit under me. David could say that, but now he had seen it over and over in his life, how God had given him not only victory, but nations he didn't have to fight, nations who surrendered, nations who wanted to make peace with him because his reputation was out there now. Don't mess with those people who worship Yahweh. Verse 48 continues to try to describe the Lord. Who delivers me from my enemies. Indeed, you exalt me above those who rise against me. From violence, uh, you rescue me. Small correction here on the last line. From violent, from violence of men or violent men. I should probably put violent men. There we have it. One more time. Verse 48. Who delivers me from my enemies. Indeed, you exalt me above those who rise against me. There's the adversary again. From violent men, you rescue me. Remember what we saw at the beginning of this psalm. David loved the Lord. Then towards the middle we saw how David was rewarded according to his righteousness and blamelessness. The Lord God also responds to David as king, as ruler of Israel. Victory comes to those who serve the Lord. That can be on a large scale or a small scale. Certainly within your life. In verses 49 and 50, David closes with more praise to the Lord for who he is and what he does. Verse 49. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. And to your name, I will sing praises. David would testify to the Lord before the nations. Those he fought, those who lost to Israel or smartly made peace with him. He says, and to your name, that's a word that represents God's divine character, his person. And to your name, I will sing praises. There's our word for praise. God will praise the God of Israel. His name, who he is, 
his perfect character. Verse 50, our final verse. He gives great deliverance to his king, that would be David, referring to himself, and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Now the deliverances, of course, would mean the victories, victory over the enemy. There is the word loving kindness, one of our main terms for loyal love, we saw back in verse 25, and shows chesed, loving kindness to his anointed, the anointed, of course, is the king. This would include David and his descendants forever. Sons of David and their sons. Those in the line of David who would live in obedience over Israel. That was mostly, uh, most all of it, of course, was in the southern kingdom. And then, of course, the ultimate and last king who rules forever will be Jesus Christ. The last son of David. Sons of David who lived in obedience would experience loving kindness from the Lord. For the king and his descendants who show love and obedience to the covenant, the Lord would in turn continue to show loyal love to the anointed, the anointed king, and bless him. Let me point out something before we close here. Now, this is from the cursing, blessing part of the covenant. We'll use the one in uh, Deuteronomy 28. We're going to look at the blessing section. If people lived obediently, they would be blessed. Let's look at two verses. I'm going to look at verses 7 and 13. Deuteronomy 28, 7. Now this is if they lived as a people obedient to the Lord. Deuteronomy 28, 7. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. Isn't that what we've just kind of seen here in the psalm? Verse 13. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail, if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them. You will always be at the top and never at the bottom. Let's close by looking at our translation that we covered today. There's a lot here, so I'm going to read it rather rapidly. Going back to verse 25. With a faithful, you prove yourself faithful. With a blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you show yourself astute. For you deliver those with humility, but those with proud eyes, you bring low. For you light my lamp. The Lord my God illumines my darkness. For by you I can run, advance quickly against a troop of soldiers, and by my God I can jump over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect, blameless. The word of the Lord is tested as pure and reliable. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a cliff rock except our God, the God who equips me with strength and makes my path smooth? He makes my feet <clears throat> He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and he enables me to stand on high places. He trains my hands for war. My arms can bend a bow of bronze and you give me the shield of salvation, deliverance, and your right hand sustains me. And your humility, willingness to condescend, enabled me to be great, that is prevail. You widen my stride beneath me, and my ankles do not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and I did not turn back until they were finished. I shattered them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. You armed me with strength for battle. You have made those who rise up to bow down beneath me. You have put the backs of my enemies to me in flight, and I destroy those who hate me. They cry for help, but there is no deliverer. 
even to the Lord, but he does not answer them. I beat them as dust upon the face before the face of the wind. I poured them out like mud on the streets. You have delivered me from the military conflicts of people. You established me as the leader of nations, a people whom I do not know serve me. At the hearing of the ear, as soon as they hear, they obey me. Sons of foreigners cringe in obedience before me. Sons of foreigners lose heart and come trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives. He's active. Blessed be my cliff rock. Exalted be the God of my deliverance. The God who execute, executes vengeance for me and makes people or nations submit under me. Who delivers me from my enemies. Indeed, you exalt me above those who rise against me. From violence, you rescue me. Therefore, I praise you, Lord, among the nations. And to your name, I will sing praises. He gives great deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Oh, Father, we thank you for this great psalm. Thank you for the lessons we've learned and the many applications that we've learned. Lord, help us learn how to praise you better, to understand how you are alive and you work in our lives every day. Help us learn to depend upon you as did David then help us follow that with praise to you. Your greatness to you belongs to glory. In Jesus' name, amen.